Hello. Welcome to Covenant Bible College, the Bible College of Practical Knowledge. Covenant Bible College offers a four-year bachelor degree that is a Bible College accredited degree and a master's degree as well as a doctorate degree. Everything is available online. You can register, receive a syllabus, purchase books, view your grades online, and be a part of a live interactive streaming class or view the class on demand. To become a part of Covenant Bible College or to get more information, visit us at www.fcmbi.net. Further contact information is also available on the website. Okay, we're going to continue our study on the art of intercession. I'm going to talk to you about the four ingredients for successful intercession. Let's say that together. The four ingredients... For successful, intercession. for successful intercession. The number one ingredient is love. And I'm going to ask you to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. You have to have a love for God and a love for people. The Bible says, Thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might, and then love your neighbor as yourself. So we have to have a love for God and a love for people. Love is a spiritual force, and this attitude will create an atmosphere for the gifts to flow in the prayer closet. The Bible says to follow after love and desire spiritual gifts. And I know in my heart and I know in my spirit that there was one of our sessions last week, and I could see that the gifts of the Spirit were imparted to many of you. But in order to flow in these giftings, we have to, first of all, be men and women of love. Let's read the definition for love. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1 says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but do not love, I have become like a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge and have all faith, so that I can remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Now here's the definition of love. What is love? Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It is not puffed up. Does not behave rudely. Another translation says, love, amplified, does not push itself forward. So if you have a prayer assignment for somebody, and your primary motivation is your love for God, to be obedient to him, because he said to Peter, do you love me? He said, yes. He said, feed my sheep. And, and, and you have a prayer assignment for somebody, and you have a love for people as well, love does not push itself forward. I don't tell people or sometimes the person about the prayer assignment I had for them because sometimes it will scare them and drive them away and it will actually nullify your prayers so as intercessors as we're walking in love walking in the highest commandment of love we do not want to behave rudely and we do not want to push ourselves forward and and tell people everything that we know if in the event that God gave you a word of wisdom or a word of knowledge for that individual you just don't want to tell them what you know and you don't want to tell anybody else what you know otherwise what happens is is we grieve the Holy Spirit and he'll stop using us in the manifestations of the gifts because in order for the gifts to manifest in our prayer closet we have to follow after love and the more we flow in that river of love and the more we follow after love, the more God will trust us to use him. So love is a prim primary ingredient when it comes to the prayer of intercession. And, and I'm stuck here for just a moment until I'm released. Love does not behave rudely, is, does not push itself forward. Okay, so we need to remember that. Love does not seek its own. It is not easily provoked. <clears throat> thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, <laughs> believes all things, 
hopes all things, endures all things, and the Bible says love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. And then let's look here at verse 13. And now abides faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. So we want to always make sure that our prayers and our intercessions are born out of our, our motive and our, 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 of our heart is that our prayers are born out of a heart of love, a heart of love for God and a heart of love for people. Uh, the Bible says in uh, Jude chapter 1, verse 21 through 23, it says here in that scripture, and of some have compassion and others Save with fear, pulling them up out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. So he's saying, have compassion for people who are lost. Have compassion who are, for people who are addicted. Have compassion, you know, for the, some of the sins that you see going on around you. Let's not judge one another, but let's be men and women of love who see what they're doing, and instead of judging them, we should have compassion. And, and the Bible says that when you love, you're bearing one another's burdens and fulfilling the law of Christ. And when you intercede and you pray for that individual, that's exactly what we're doing. We're walking in love and we're bearing their burdens and we are not criticizing and we are not judging, lest we ourselves be judged. So we want to be men and women of love. And the more you walk in the Spirit, the more God uses you in more of a supernatural vein of prayer, the more, you know, love will keep you at, keep you checked, okay? So it's, it's just a good thing to always maintain the attitude of love. Number two, vision. There's two sources of vision. Um, number one, there's the rhema word, and we talked about that last week, where we had the rhema word for the East Coast, where God said this land that's desolate is going to become like the Garden of Eden. So we had that rhema word. What is a rhema word? A rhema word is when God gives you a scripture about that situation or about your family, and that's the word you stand on. For example, you say, and my household. That's your vision. Are you listening? So you say, that's my vision. I'm standing on that, and I'm not letting go. That is a rhema word for you. And you know that's your scripture. You own that scripture. That's your scripture. And then what does that do? It causes faith to arise in your heart, and you have vision. Amen? Amen? Okay. So that vision can come from a rhema word, a word from the Bible, and it becomes your word. Or it can come by an inward revelation. What's an inward revelation? You just see it. You just see the end result. You've already seen it. You know it's coming, and that God has given you that vision. And in order to keep praying and keep pursuing, you just, nothing can take you off that. You already saw it. And so therefore, you're going to keep praying into it. Uh, Luke 18, 1 says, men ought to always pray and not faint. When you have vision, you're not going to faint. Amen? Amen? When you've already seen the end result, you're not going to faint. Habakkuk 2, verse 1 through 3 says, I will stand on my watch and I will set myself on the rampart and watch to see what he will say to me. We're going to get into this later, but an intercessor is a watchman. And they see things coming before anybody else sees them coming. Because an intercessor is a watchman and they're set on the walls of a city, of a family, of a nation. And they have vision and they can see things coming from afar. As a matter of fact, the word of wisdom is given to warn you of impending danger. You can have a vision of something coming that's futuristic, and you can abort that through the prayer of intercession. These things are given that, that, that you can war a good warfare. And so if you have a vision of some impending danger, and you've seen it coming to your family or coming to your city, you can abort that thing. Because anything that's negative, the Bible says, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus said, I've come that you may have life, and life more abundant. So God will warn you through the word of wisdom of, in, of impending danger, something coming in the future. And you can put a stop to it because an intercessor is also a watchman who stands on the walls of a family, I'm going to say it again, a city or a nation, and because of his position, he can see the trouble coming from afar. 
You think about a watchman on the walls of a city, a natural city. You know, they're they're way up high. The people down below in the in the you know the, the the city people, they can't see what's going on. But a watchman's up high. He can see things. Okay, and you're a watchman. If even in your own family, you're a watchman in your very family, and there will be things God will show you. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit is given that he may show you things to come. And the things that he shows you that's to come may be something negative. And you, as an intercessor, as a watchman in your own house, can abort it, put a stop to it, and, and cause it not to come into your family walls, into your family line, into your city, if it's something for your city. Are you listening? And he said, I will watch to see what he will say to me and what I will answer when I am corrected. And the Lord answered and said, write the vision. <laughs> I'm just getting that scripture again. Jeremiah, what do you see? <laughs> Jeremiah, what do you see? Write the vision. Write what you see. And make it plain on the tablets that he may run with it who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie, though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come. So we talked about this in our, a while ago, that what we see in our spirits is the true reality. So whatever you see and whatever God has given you, this is the ingredient that you need to pray into it. Proverbs 29, 18 says, where there is no revelation... Or vision, the King James says, the people cast off restraint, but happy is he who keeps the law. And we said this before, we'll say it again, discouragement is the beginning of the loss of vision. Don't think, nothing is too hard for God. Don't think that family member's not, is, is too hard for God, because you know, where sin abounds, grace does so much more abound. Sometimes the worse they are, the better it is, because that's more grace that you need to pray on them. Okay, are you listening? So discouragement is the beginning of the loss of vision. So when you find yourself losing your vision, that's when usually discouragement comes in and you start to be, you start to get clouded. Well, get back, go back to your journal. Read what you put in your journal and what you saw in your prayer time and then get your vision back and pray into it. Let's go to Luke chapter 2. So we're talking about the ingredients to successful intercession. Number one is love. And number two is vision. I want you to turn to Luke chapter 2. Are you there? It says here in verse 36, And there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher, and she was of a great age, and she lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. And I liked Anna. Because Anna had purpose. She lost her husband, and she could have been really sad and thought her destiny was over. But instead, she took a hold of something bigger than anything of this earth. She made a decision she was not going to live for this world, and she made a decision she was not going to live in self-pity. She made a decision she was going to make her latter years count. Do you know your latter years will be greater than your former years if you just allow God to work in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And Anna made a decision. My latter years are going to count. I'm going to do something for God. I have a purpose and I have a destiny. And let's see what it was. And this woman was a widow of about 84 years. And this was her calling. This, what she cho this is what, how she chose to live her latter years. She did not depart from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And coming in that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord, and she spoke of him to all who looked for the redemption. Basically, Anna was a prophetess. She made a decision. She was going to make prayer and intercession her ministry. And as a prophet, you will see things in the spirit. And Anna saw some things in the spirit. And her purpose and her calling was to pray that vision through. To pray that vision out. Are you listening? So she made prayer her ministry. 
She picked up the mantle of the power of prayer and she said, my singleness is not going to be misery. My singleness is going to be misery. I'm going to pray. I've seen the Redeemer coming. And what she did was she spent time in the presence of God and she interceded night and day until Jesus came to the earth. Some things that have been prophesied over you need to be prayed out in the word and in the spirit. Okay? So Anna had vision. Number three, desire. The third ingredient to successful intercession is desire. What kind of desire? Three things. Number one, to be intimate with God. Moses was one of the greatest intercessors that ever walked the face of this earth. Well, one of. And the Bible says he knew God face to face as a man would speak to his friend. He was close to God. He was intimate with God. An intercessor is close to the heart of God. Number two, a desire to see people saved and set free. So you have to have that desire. Well, Margie, sometimes I don't, you know, I don't have that desire. Well, you can stir up that desire. How do you stir it up? You just start getting back into the flow of prayer, back into the flow of intercession. Number three, a desire to see his plan, his kingdom established on the earth. I have two scriptures I'd like to quote. Habakkuk 1.5 says, Behold ye among the heathen and watch. God said, I will work a work in your day that if it were told you it would be like a dream we should have a desire to see God work a work in our day that if it were told us it would be like a dream number four faith we have to have faith Hebrews 11 1 says without faith it is impossible to please God so as men and women of prayer, and specifically intercession, we have to have faith. Now go with me to Romans chapter 4. Romans 4, we have to have faith. Romans 4, verse 17. Speaking of Abraham, God promised him he would be the father of many nations. Abraham received the promise and said, yes, Lord. Amen. God said, I've made you the father of many nations. And look here at verse 17. In the presence of him whom he believed, God, who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did, who contrary to hope, in hope believed so that he became the father of many nations according to what was spoken. So shall your descendants be, verse 19, and being not weak in faith, he did not consider his own body now dead, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. And verse 20 says, he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God, verse 21, and being fully convinced, not partially, not maybe, not hope so, not maybe my family will be saved, not maybe that person will be saved, not maybe revival's going to come to my city or my nation. No, he was fully convinced. He already saw it. He already believed. He already had the vision for it. And being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. So when it comes to the prayer of intercession, we have to have faith. And we have to have the God kind of faith and the Abraham kind of faith who when, especially when we see things accomplished in prayer, instead of speaking negative, we call those things that be not as though they are. See, because what happens in intercession, you will see things accomplished before you ever see them manifested in the natural realm. And so instead of nullifying your prayers, nullifying the thing you prayed through, keep calling those things that be not as though they were. You know, Lord, I thank you. You said, my, you know, your, your child gets more unruly. As a matter of fact, they get sometimes get worse before they get better because your prayers are working. <laughs> Just say, Father, I thank you that my child is saved and has come to the knowledge of the truth. I thank you. And just call those things that be not as though they were, especially when you've already prayed them through to victory. Okay, we're going to move on. 
And basically, we're going to move on to discussing the church, our kingdom authority, strongholds, demon power. But before we do, we want to lay a clear foundation. I'm going to ask you to go to Genesis 2. There's more of a teaching anointing in this session, and that's good. It's fine. As a matter of fact, I had made a decision. I could just quote all these scriptures to you if I had typed them all out, but the Spirit said, no, I want my people to see them. Because the scripture says, my people perish for lack of knowledge. And so when we rightly divide the word of truth and we go into the scriptures and we read them for ourselves, it helps us to understand who our enemy is because the Bible says he does not want us to be ignorant of Satan's devices. Number two, it helps us to understand our God-given authority and the fact that God has given us, the church, authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt us but we're living in a time and we're living in a season where there is a whole generation of people that don't understand the fall of Adam they don't understand how uh, Jesus was the second Adam. They don't understand that our authority has been re 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 give, yeah, given back to us. And so therefore we need to teach them and explain to them exactly what it means to have authority on the earth and why we needed Jesus to come and why he had to take back the keys. So are you with me? So as we teach this, I want you to understand we're not just teaching you we are teaching your children and we are teaching your children's children and we need to get this truth into their hearts so let's look here at Adam and Eve we're gonna lay a clear foundation the church in our kingdom authority God said here in, in Genesis chapter 2 Verse 15. And the Lord God took man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and to keep it. Now, God created Adam and Eve. In the image of God created he them. And God made earth for Adam and Eve. And what he did was he set Adam and Eve in to the garden and he said to Adam and Eve now I'm gonna give you the garden and this is what I want you to do I want you to tend it and to keep it that word tend means cultivate I'm giving you this job and it's a job and this is what I want you to do I want you to keep the garden and it's yours this is your land I'm giving it to you he put him in the garden to tend it and to keep it. Verse 16, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat, you will surely die. So what happened is God put Adam and Eve in the garden. He said, now I'm giving you the garden, and I want you to protect it and to keep it. But if you disobey me, you will surely die. The Bible was written in Hebrew and in Greek. If you check the scripture out in the Hebrew, what it says is, in the day that you eat of the tree or you disobey me, basically, he said, in dying, thou shalt surely die. In other words, you disobey me and you don't do your job, what's going to happen is in dying spiritually, you will die physically. When God created Adam and Eve, he created Adam and Eve alive unto him and there was no separation. But God knew that he had an enemy 
The Bible speaks of Lucifer. Ezekiel 28, 11 through 18. And so God knew that he had an enemy, and his name was Lucifer. And Lucifer was the anointed cherub that covereth. And what happened with Lucifer was, is he, he orchestrated the worship in heaven. Are you kidding me? He orchestrated the worship in heaven. And the Bible called Lucifer the anointed cherub that covereth. And what happened with Lucifer was, I believe, because of the anointing that he carried, he created iniquity within himself. He was lifted up in pride, and he fell, and he took a third of the angels with him, and they are what we call fallen spirits, demon spirits. That's why the Bible says that the devil goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So when God put Adam and Eve in the garden to dress it and to keep it and to tend it, God knew that Adam and Eve had an enemy. And he was fully aware of these demon fallen spirits that were roaming about. And the reason God told Adam that he, he, the reason that God set up this law was to protect them. And just so you know, Adam and Eve was created in the image and in the likeness of God, and God liked Adam. And God enjoyed Adam. And God wanted to have fellowship with Adam. And that's what the devil hates about you, and he hates about me. He hates our intimacy with Jesus Christ. He hates the love relationship that we have with him. And that's what, you know, Adam and Eve had with God. But he warned them. He said, listen, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, because if you do, you will die. And God knew that Adam and Eve had an enemy. Okay? Are you listening? <sighs> Glory to Jesus. I don't know where it says it because I can't see it in my notes, but the Bible says that God said, here it is, Genesis 1, and God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Now here, this is what I want. And let them have dominion, this is key, over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he them, male and female. Verse 28, Genesis 1. Then God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it, and have, the key word again is dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God said to Adam and Eve, this is what I want you to do. I want you to tend the garden. I want you to guard the garden. But I want you to understand that if you disobey me and go outside my laws, God knew, Adam and Eve didn't know, but God knew that there would be an enemy that would try to get in. But he said to Adam and Eve, he said, I'm giving you dominion over the entire earth. Now that word dominion in the Hebrew is R-A-D-A. And it means to tread, to rule, to have dominion, and to dominate. So Adam, I'm giving you dominion over the earth. You're to rule the earth. You're to dominate the earth. And the definition for the word dominion is rule and authority. So what happened? What happened is Adam opened up the door to the devil. Now go to Luke chapter 4 while I'm talking. Because I'm going to teach it line upon line. What happened is, Adam and Eve opened up the door to the devil, and they let the devil in. They disobeyed God. They ate of the tree, and then that was it. Suddenly, the intimacy that they had with their creator was broken. They, they, they figured out that they were naked. 
the faith that they once had in God was turned into fear. And the Bible says they hid themselves from the presence of God. Okay? So Adam and Eve turned the whole thing over to the devil. And I'd like to call it like this. It's like he, they committed high treason. They sold out to the devil. What was once given to them was lost. They gave it right into the hands of the enemy. Look here at Luke chapter 4, verse 6. Now, Jesus is in the place, in the wilderness, and he's being tempted by the devil. And the devil says several things to him, trying to get him off of his destiny. And verse 5, and the devil taking him up on a high mountain showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment in time. Think about it. And the devil said to him, All authority I will give you and their glory, for this has been delivered to me, and I can give it to whoever I want. Now, we know as students of the Bible that. This was a real temptation that Jesus went through. So this is a real statement of fact concerning the enemy. He said here, everything's been given to me. I have all this authority. It was delivered to me. Where was it? When was it delivered? It was delivered when Adam and Eve turned the earth over to the devil. And I'm going to say this, and then we're going to continue. And what happened is when Satan came in, he brought all the one-third of heaven with him. All the fallen spirits, all the evil spirits. And we're going to get into this, and this is all the stuff we got to deal with as intercessors. This is all the stuff that tries to influence our young people. This is all the stuff that tries to keep our families from being saved. The Bible says that Satan is the God of this age, the God of this world. Right now, Satan is the God of this world. That's why we have to pray. Because we're going to find out, because I'm going to take you there, that in Christ Jesus, the dominion and the authority has been restored. So he said, all authority has been given unto me. And, and all the glory, <laughs> and for this has been delivered to me. That word authority in verse 6 is exousia. You ready for this definition? Think about this. The devil says, all authority has been given to me. It was delivered to me. I got it. In Adam, everybody fell. This is what he gave me. That word is exousia. It means authority, power. The right to control or govern. Yeah, you know, Philadelphia, that's my city. No, it's not. We'll talk about that in a minute. Dominion, the arena or sphere of jurisdiction, a ruler, human or supernatural authority, right, liberty, and strength. So the devil said, it's all mine. And Jesus, you know the story of Jesus. He said, no. Now, Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. You may say, well, why are you taking so much time? Well, I know I have the Spirit because the Holy Spirit wants me to take the time because we need to understand dominion and rulership and authority and what happened. And we have a lot of people that go do a lot of flaky things when it comes to pulling down strongholds and demons and devils and all that. And we want to make sure that we teach this word accurately. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 45. And so it is written, the first Adam became a living being, and the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, and afterward, the spiritual. Verse 47, the first man was of the earth made of dust. The second man is of the Lord from heaven. <laughs> so what happened is Jesus came to the earth to redeem the earth. He came to the earth as the intercessor, 
and his purpose was to save humanity from their sin. So Jesus became the second Adam. Now look at Ephesians chapter 6. Jesus is talking about the armor of God, and then I'm going to pull it all together in a minute. He's saying, put on the whole armor of God. First of all, he says, first of all, he's telling you and I, we have an enemy. These fallen spirits are still here. He says, finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to what? Stand against your crazy, you know, relative that's doing all kinds of crazy things. Is that what he said? Do you know that the spirit world is more real than the natural world? You may say, well, why? Well, because the spirit world was here first, and it is more real than the natural world. He said that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. That word wiles is scheming. Verse 12, for we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against powers, principalities, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. What he's talking about is when Adam and Eve fell, these are the things that came into the earth, and these are the things in intercession that you and I have to deal with. And that's why it's important for us to know who we are in Christ, to understand that we are in him, that Jesus is the second Adam, and that Christ is in us, and it is the hope of glory, and that we have on the same armor of God that Jesus had when he came to the earth. And that when the enemy sees us in prayer, in intercession, he doesn't see you in the flesh. He sees the finished work of Jesus Christ on the inside of you. And my friends, this may come as a surprise, but the devil is afraid of you. We joke about it on Facebook, and there's this cute little thing we send around, those of us who are friends, and it's, oh my goodness, she is up again, and the devil trembles. Well, that's how it is. And the enemy doesn't want us to know who we are in Christ and our power and our authority in prayer. I said something to one of my kids the other day, and those of you that have children, it's, it's, it's almost heartbreaking. I said to them, I said, do you understand the power that is in the name of Jesus and why you have power in the name of Jesus? And you're talking to 18, 19, 20, 21 year olds and they just turn to me and they go, nope, no clue. The only way they're going to get a clue is if they go to Bible school these days because we teach at times such a watered down gospel in our churches and everybody wants a seeker friendly church because they want to build their churches. Well, God is interested in kingdom purposes and we need to teach our young people who they are in Christ. We need to teach them the authority of the believer. They need to understand why there is power in the name of Jesus because God said, I've given you authority to tread on the serpents and the scorpions and over the power of the enemy. The devil is, 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 it's almost like it's the opposite. Unless there's some mothers and men that know how to pray and keep that stuff off of our kids. So, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. And I don't mind telling you. And devil, you're not stopping me. And I'm going to keep preaching the word. You hear me? We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, and rulers of the darkness of this age, and spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Can I just say something before we go on? Go to 2 Corinthians and, well, we're talking, you know, 2 Corinthians and, who do you think is behind all this music? I heard a prophet say one time, and he's a true prophet, and, and he said he saw some of these musicians, when they would sing and when they would play their music, literally baptizing whole groups or, or, or con not congregations, but, you know, these co audiences with slime. They're just the vessels that the enemy flows through to get his message out and to influence. Well, we have power over the devil, and we're going to learn about that. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3. Though we walk in the flesh, 
I'm sure there's a better translation for this. We do not war according to the flesh. Everyone say war. war. You are in a war. I get it. We win. I get that. But there is a war going on, and it's the war between good and evil. For example, do you remember before you got saved what it was like? You could actually feel the war. You could feel, I could, could you, anybody else? There was like a tug of war. I could feel good pulling me. I could feel evil pulling me. But I found out later that there was this pastor and his wife that they were praying the prayer of intercession for me, and that's why there was all this war going on. Now, the prayer of intercession does not overpower someone's will, but it will bring them to a place when you've lifted up with the idea of completely removing that scruple of conscience. It will bring a person to a place where they can make a realistic decision for Jesus. And most people who see Jesus and all his goodness and his glory, most people will come to repentance. But it says here, we don't, we don't war. There's, wars, wars. There's war over your family, my sister, the sister right here. There's war over our families. See? But you see, you're an intercessor. You could stand in the gap for the land. You could put, or for your family. You could put up that hedge. You, you have more authority and more power just in your own self. Sometimes, you know, we think we should ask everybody to pray for our family members. In your own home, you are a watchman in your own home. And you have more authority and more power than a person who's not a blood relative. And the devil sees that, and he is afraid of us taking our place. There is war over your children. There is war over their destinies. But greater is he that is in us than he that's in the world. I am not stopping. I am not quitting until I see the fulfillment of the prophecies God has given me over my children. And over our land. And over our nation. He said, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments and imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and taking every thought cap into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So the point I want to make out of this scripture is the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, and we'll get into us. We have the word of God, which is the sword of the Spirit. We have the name of Jesus. And we have the power of praying in other tongues. People say to me, does the devil understand it when you pray in tongues? He doesn't understand that. That's why he's fighting the church right now about praying in the Spirit. Because when you pray in tongues, you're speaking directly unto God. But there are times in intercession where I find myself it's like I'm at war and I have these warring kind of tongues and I find myself praying and it's not that I'm yelling at God, but I find myself in this place of prayer where there's a struggle, there's a wrestle, there's something going on. And it's not that I'm striking against God. I'm coming against these principalities. I'm coming against the things that are trying to keep some of my family members down. And there's this back and forth and back and forth going on. We'll get into this. Remember what we said, some things are better caught than taught. The devil doesn't understand tongues, but he knows that when you pray in tongues, his stronghold has to come down. <laughs> because the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God, the pulling down of strongholds. And he sees that when you pray in tongues, and especially when you're starting into that vein of striking against him, something about his kingdom and his power is being demolished. We'll get into that. So, these are fallen spirits. But all authority has been given back to the church. Now go to Hebrews 2. Is everybody good? Hebrews 2. See, God doesn't want our young people in fear. Fear is torment. And men's hearts will fail for fear in these last days. 
And what I see in my heart, I see a lot of them are afraid. There's more anxiety and more fear. Well, when they know who they are in Christ, they're not going to be afraid. The devil will be afraid of them. Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself, speaking of Jesus, likewise shared in the same that what? That through death, through what? Through the death of Jesus. When Jesus came to the earth, he was the intercessor. He was the second Adam. Adam lost control. Adam lost dominion. The authority was given over to the devil and all of his demon spirits that are under him. And then when Jesus came, he fixed it. He restored it. It says here that through death, through Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, because the Bible says he went into the lower parts of the earth, it says here he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, who? The devil. And release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So Jesus destroyed him that had the power of death. That is to say, the devil. Look at 1 John 3, 8. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Yes, First John 3, 8 says, He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. Let's all read this together, New King James. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works <laughs> Of the devil. So who is in you, intercessors? He ever lives to make intercession. Christ is in us, the hope of glory. I've got good news for you. For this purpose are you manifested in the earth that you might destroy the works of the devil. Look at Colossians 2. The Bible says that if I come to you, there's different ways I can come to you. I could come to you prophesying. I can come to you teaching. And then that scripture goes on to say, but if I come to you in an uncertain sound, I won't prepare you for the battle. There's times we need prophecy. There's times we need preaching. And there's times we need teaching. And I believe we need to teach this truth. Because if I don't teach this truth, I am not going to prepare you for the battle. And there is warfare and intercession. Colossians 2.15. We'll go ahead and begin reading at verse 13. And you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all your trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way and nailed it to the cross. Remember, Jesus is the second Adam. And what happened? Verse 15. <laughs> Glory be to God. Glory to God. Lord, increase us in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. I pray the eyes of our understanding be enlightened, that we would see who we are in Christ. And having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. So Jesus spoiled principalities and powers. He made a show of the devil, devil openly, and he triumphed over all the works of the enemy. Revelations chapter 1. I got a river of life flowing out of me. Makes the lame to walk and the blind to see. Opens prison doors, sets the captives free. 
I got a river of life flowing out of me. Spring up, oh well. Within my soul, spring up, oh well. And continue to make me whole. Spring up, oh well. And give to me that life abundantly. Look here at Revelations chapter 1. Verse 17, so Jesus said, don't be afraid. Yep, there's demons. Yep, there's fallen spirits. Yep, there's principalities and powers. Yep, they're around. Yep, people are being baptized in slime at these rock concerts. Yep, there's a lot of things that, 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 that uh, Gene Wilk, or was that Wilkerson prophesied, you know, that all this stuff was going to be coming through our TVs. We're not afraid of that. We're not afraid of that because greater is he that's in us. Do not be afraid. Jesus said, words in red, because of the words of Jesus, I am the first, I am the last, I am he who lives and was dead. I became the second Adam, I became sin for you who knew no sin, so that you would be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You're alive unto God, your relationship has been restored, and not only your relationship with him, so you can have intimacy with him, but your dominion and your authority as a believer has been restored. God said, I didn't leave anything out. It's the gospel of salvation. It's soteria. It's deliverance, healing, safety, and soundness. It's everything. And you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. So, God's not afraid, and he doesn't want us to be afraid. Well, I don't know that I want to go into that kind of intercession. I don't know that I want to get into this type of teaching. The devil t fights this teaching. Are you with me? Because he doesn't want us to enter into his domain because he doesn't want to give up. But we say unto the principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this world that every place the sole of our foot treads upon. God said he's given it to us. That means he's given us our cities. That means he's given us our nations. And that means we have complete rule and authority over all the earth. What we need to do is we need to take our place. And it's not going to be the kind of praying that you believe and you confess and you go la di da di da There is a war in the spirit. There is a place in intercession where you go in and you know you're entering into the enemy's territory but you're not going in with your own strength you're going in because Jesus spoiled principalities and powers and made a show of him openly you're going in with the full armor of God and you've got the helmet of salvation you've got the word of God you've got the breastplate of faith you're walking in love so there's no cracks in your armor and you're going into that place of prayer and you're hitting head on with that stubborn demon spirit that has been in your family line a long time or has been in your city for a long time or who wants to take over your nation you know the bible says i just sought for one man that would stand in the gap and put up the head just one kenneth e hagan once said he'd hear people always say well you know the united states of america is going under they're going under and going under and they'd be so negative and talking negative and then you know he was always kind of quiet and then when he talked you know you know you better listen and he would speak up and he'd say <laughs> he'd say no they're not and they're like well how do you know and he'd say because i'm here God said, I only need one man to stand in the gap. Just one. He said, and I'm here. And I, I got to tell you, he doesn't just have one. He's got many, 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 many of us who are willing to say yes to him. But we've got to understand the art of intercession. There are some things that we will never have breakthrough on unless we go in and we break it through. And the ones that are going to do, do it is us. It's the Christ in us doing it. So he goes on and he says, I am the first and the last, verse 18. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. <laughs> I love it. And have the keys of Hades and of death. Whatever you have the keys to something, that means you have ownership. Who's got the keys to your house? You have the keys to your house. 
Who's got the keys to your car? Whatever you have the keys to, ownership. And God said, then Jesus said, I have the keys of hell and of death. So when Jesus went into the, after, when he died on the cross, he, in dying, thou shalt surely die. He died spiritually because in order for him to take our place, he had to become sin who knew no sin. And for the first time in his life, he was separated from the Father God. He took our place. He went into hell. He went into the lower parts of the earth. And the Bible says he went in, and when he came up, he took, came out with the keys of hell, death, and the grave. And he disarmed the principalities and the powers. Amen. Keys signify power and authority. And Jesus said, I've given you the keys. Don't tell me that your family member is on their way to hell and they're going to keep going to hell. No, you have authority. You have the keys. You are their protection. Look at Matthew 28. All of this is in the Bible. It's all in the Bible. Matthew 28. Jesus said in verse 18, it's done. It is finished. I already did everything that I'm going to do. Listen. Look at me. And now I need you. I've already done everything that I'm going to do. The Bible says he is the head. We are the body. The body can't do anything without the head. He's the head, we're the body. It would be kind of weird if we saw my head walking out the door, my body staying here, right? The head and the body work together. We are the head, he is the head, we are the body. We work together. So he says here, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. I got it all back, and now you're my body. <laughs> you're the church why don't we just go to church and let's just have a nice little service let's just learn about being positive and all that's good but what about kingdom churches Come on. churches that are taking the kingdom yeah. churches that are authority have their authority and know who they are in Christ I've often said this you can have a mega church and they have very little kingdom authority, and then you could have a church of a hundred people. They got more authority in the realm of the spirit and are doing more for God in the realm of the spirit than that mega church of 15. It's not that the mega church of 15,000 isn't good. We need all kinds of churches. But for this purpose, am I manifested on the earth and are you manifested on this earth? And that's why you're here, that you might destroy the works of the devil. So he says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and in earth. That word authority is exousia. Mm -hmm. All authority has been given unto me in heaven and in earth. That means the right to exercise power. Or the power of rule or government. And so he says, this has all been given to me and this is what I want you to do. And then we're going to close. He says, I want you to go therefore. I'm the head, but I need you. You're the body. So what I want you to do is go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all I have commanded you. And then he says, now listen, you really think, you think you're going to do this in your own strength? You're not doing it in your own strength. He says, lo, I am with you always. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. You have me, the warrior, on the inside of you. Mark 16, 17 says, These signs will follow them that believe. They will lay hands on the sick, and the sick will recover. But it's going to happen. How is it going to happen? How is that kingdom, how is the rulership established? It's through the name of Jesus. He said, in my name you will cast out devils. John 14, verse 12 and 13 says, Jesus said, In that day 
you will ask me nothing, but whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. The scripture also goes on to say, if you ask or demand anything in my name, he said, I will do it. Amplified, I believe, says, I will be there to back it up. So it's just as if Jesus is there when we use our authority. Last scripture, Philippians 2, and then we're going to move on to talking about interceding against the powers of darkness. I'm going to be honest with you. I wrote my first book on the art of intercession. And when I knew I had to teach this webinar... I said, God, I just want to make sure that what I'm teaching is accurate and correct. And so I went through all the scriptures and all the things on this side of intercession because there's two sides to intercession. There's the side when you're striking against something, like what we're talking about, and then there's the side where you're going to God. So it's important that we teach this with accuracy. Philippians chapter 2, verse 9 through 11. Jesus made himself of no reputation, took on the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men, verse 8, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. There it is again, Jesus becoming the second Adam, Jesus taking our place, Jesus doing the work so that we could have dominion and authority restored back to us that Adam and Eve gave up. Therefore, God has highly exalted him, and given him the name, notice it, I noticed this too, it didn't say a name. <laughs> he said he has given him the name, which is above every name. And that, that the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those in heaven, of those on the earth, and even those under the earth. So Jesus has authority in three realms, and he said to you and I, I give you power and authority. The same authority I have, you have. Just use my name. Now I'm going to read you a little something off my Blackberry. I had a dream, and I wanted to read it to you before we close. I, I've been getting more dreams lately. I don't get them often, but I believe that I had this dream because God knew that I was going to be ministering in this webinar, and it was for someone in some city, somewhere. I dreamed my husband and I were pull, pulled over by the police. We were going down a regular road, minding our own business. We weren't speeding, nothing. We were just good people, good citizens normal looking people, you know, didn't have pink hair and stuff hanging all over our car. We just had a nice car, just normal people just driving through a street. And they came, not that I'm against pink hair, I'm not against pink hair. My daughter has this little pink thing going on in her hair. I'm okay with it. They came over to our car, and they were very intimidating. It was actually pretty scary, especially when you're an innocent person and you didn't do anything wrong. Right away, one of them pulled out a white envelope full of money. The one took the money out and was showing me the money. And actually what happened is the one police officer was intimidating my husband and the other police officer opened the back door of the car and was showing me the money and was intimidating me. I knew he wanted money from us and he was very intimidating and although nothing was said, you know, fear is a spiritual force. You could feel it. People don't even have to say, you just know what they're thinking by the force that's behind their thoughts. They were very intimidating, and then I, we needed help. Another car pulled up behind us, and I was trying to tell them that we needed help and that something wasn't wrong. 
it was a couple and the wife just walked up to our car and she had such fear on her face and she had a white envelope full of money and said nothing but just turned and gave it to the other police officer finally I started speaking the name of Jesus and began to quote that one verse that says every knee will bow every tongue confess that he is Lord <laughs> and they started to shake like they and they acted like they were becoming paralyzed and I was speaking right into the older police officers face every knee will bow every tongue confess that he Jesus Christ is Lord and they got into their car and they were shaking and paralyzed so to speak and left us and I woke up and I said to God what was that all about and this is what the Holy Ghost said to me first of all it showed me the power in the name of Jesus and the authority that I have in the name of Jesus and number two this speaks of police corruption in some city terrible police corruption they were targeting innocent people and now I'm hearing 2nd Chronicles 7 14 it says if my people which are called by my name would humble themselves and pray and seek my face I'd forgive their sin and turn turn their sin and heal their land turn from their wicked ways why did you say that I said all that to say this we have authority over that <coughs> and there is a city I don't know if it's Philadelphia I don't know where it is but there is a city under the sound of my voice that has terrible police corruption and you and I as intercessors have power and authority over that because that is a stronghold and we can break the power of that through the art of intercession and the Bible says that when you pray and we're going to get into this in our next session everything hidden will be revealed it's not God's will that innocent people suffer it's not God's will that men who are in authority misuse and abuse their authority but you and I as Christians as God gives us dreams as he opens up our eyes as the gifts of the Spirit operate in prayer we can see things and we can change them okay so we're going to see you in 15 minutes. We're going to take a break.